I'll get started in just a minute. I had everything all set up and then tried to rearrange my windows and accidentally closed with Zoom. So let's get this all ready. Okay, well, I uh, forgot to put a uh, slide in here reminding me to go through and introduce or have everyone introduce themselves. So um, hopefully I remember to do that, but I will wait until we have gotten started a little bit so people have time to come in. And the first thing I want to, well, yes, uh, welcome to the R for Data Science uh, book club. Um, I want to start off by introducing everyone to something that I will sometimes forget to do that we put start in the chat when we have actually started the meeting and then end or finish uh, when we're done. And that makes the editing of the videos um, automatic and it's very helpful to me. So I'll try to remember it, but if I ever forget, uh, please anyone can say it and that will keep everything going smoothly. So, all right. Um, so this is uh, cohort 10 of the a book club for the book, R for Data Science by Hadley Wickham, uh, Mina Chetankaya Rundell and Garrett Rol Grolmond. Um, this is the second edition of the book. If you have the first edition, um, I recommend reading the second edition online because they updated a whole bunch of stuff um, that I haven't read yet. So it will be exciting. Um, what we're looking at right now is uh, shared notes or slides, trying to feel like slides. And I'll talk about that um, in just a moment. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. So, um, you know, this is our first meeting. And for some of you, it's probably your first R4DS book club meeting at all. Uh, and so we're going to run through kind of how these things work. Uh, so the general idea is each week a volunteer will lead a discussion of the chapter. Um, this is by far the best way to learn the material, and I highly recommend that everyone sign up. There is a spreadsheet linked in the channel um, on the Slack, and I'll also be sharing that in the channel in a moment. Um, we already have signups for the next couple of weeks, so that's great. Uh, but just sign up for a chapter or, um, you know, or wait and sign up later, but I highly recommend claiming a chapter. It's the best way to learn because you know, you're kind of forced to think about it. And then also you'll have that little uh, video um, proof that you participated in this club. So that's uh, another reason to do that. Um, the presentations generally are some form of like review of the material. Um, it might be just some questions that you had as you went through it, maybe a live demo. Sometimes people will apply uh, what they learn um, the basic level is just kind of walk through these slides, which, have, you know, this is the 10th cohort. And so uh, the last uh, three, I think, have been on the second edition and they've updated the slides quite pretty much to match the book. So you can just go through the slides. I did a fair amount of kind of cleaning them up to make them feel more like what I wanted them to be. But, um, you know, you could just use exactly what's there and that's fine, too. Um, and then just use it kind of as a, a guide to lead the discussion. Um, there is a uh, GitHub repo that has info about how to edit. And these are, all of these are linked at r4ds.io slash r4ds. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in a minute. And... Um, in general, but just there is a, a whole thing to help you uh, walk through editing. Um, it's actually much easier now that they exist. So we'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, an important piece is that all of these meetings are recorded and put on our shared online or R4DS online learning community YouTube channel. Um, if 
there's, you know, if you have a problem with that for any reason, uh, number one, let me know. And then number two, you know, keep your camera off and whatnot. Um, we do that so that if anyone misses, they can catch up. And then sometimes people aren't able to join the club at all, but they can kind of read along with us. Um, something that I skipped on the main one here is there is a link to the uh, code of conduct, which I just learned or just discovered uh, moments ago was broken. It might be fixed now. Yes. All right. It is fixed. Um, so we have this code of conduct. Um, it is uh, a standard code of conduct. Um, but the general idea is, you know, we are welcoming. Um, we welcome everybody. Um, the asterisk of unless you're not welcoming each other's <laughs> and being a jerk about it. Uh, and so there are specifics here, but, um, you know, don't be a jerk. And if anything bad is happening, let us know at um, rfordatasci at gmail.com. Uh, at the moment, uh, I am the only person who receives this. And uh, I just went through it like a workshop on running things like this and had it pointed out that technically I need to have something else in case I'm the person that you want to complain about. So we are going to add that of making sure that it's possible to do that. Um, Tan Ho and Lydia Gibson on the Slack are also administrators of the site. So if I do anything, uh, talk to them and they can take care of things. So hopefully <laughs> that would never be a thing, but you know, maybe I'll say something and not realize it or things like that. So, um, all right, uh, that's all of that. Um, we're going to aim for one chapter per week. Um, if you own a chapter, if you're leading the discussion for a chapter and you just can't, like there's just too much material there, uh, it's okay to split it. And then likewise, um, there are likely going to be some chapters that just feel really fast. And if you're setting things up and you're like, I, I want to take this one and the next one, that's also fine. Um, I don't know. I haven't read this edition yet. Um, first edition was pretty on the money for it feels like about a chapter a week. Um, but and my guess is second edition is probably even more so because uh, they've had time to kind of hone it. Uh, but again, if we need to split things, we can split things. If we need to combine, we can combine. And uh, then the plan is we'll meet every week, um, except holidays, et cetera. One of the big et cetera's on that is something that affects R4DS and a site wide is um, daylight savings is ending in the Northern hemisphere at the end of this month. And it ends on different days. And that week between Europe and the US is just a nightmare for the book clubs. So we shut down all the book clubs for a week uh, to keep things from colliding with one another. So that's in the schedule already that we're going to skip that. And, you know, if our meeting is going to fall on top of a major holiday, uh, we'll probably skip, but we'll talk about, you know, what's important to everyone in the club. Um, other than those, other than like planned skips, my philosophy is that we should try to meet no matter what, because if like, let's say the person who was going to present can't show up, a lot of cl clubs will skip. And then it kind of fizzles and some clubs just don't make it if that happens. So I'm going to try to meet every week. And if the presenter is not ready, I'll lead the discussion or someone else can volunteer. Um, so we'll try that out. We'll see how it actually goes. Cause sometimes it's just, you know, the whole group can't make it, but uh, for the most part, that's what we'll aim at. Um, and I do have the chat open over. I keep looking over here because I have, your faces in the chat on my other monitor. Um, so if you have any questions as I go along, definitely feel free to ask in the chat um, or to you know unmute and uh, ask out loud. Um, so as you go through these notes, you will see that there are learning objectives at the beginning of the chapter. Um, I have worked in uh, like educational technology for a long time and just in general, if you tell people what they're supposed to learn or what you expect to learn, they learn it more than if you don't. <laughs> and so um, I started this policy of, or this practice of putting learning objectives at the top of, or at the, like as slide one. And um, all the groups have pretty much kept up with it, which is kind of neat. 
Uh, and so we do have learning objectives. I'll probably edit them as we go because um, you know there are some things that could be cleaner in them. The general idea is think you know if you are creating learning objectives or trying to edit the learning objectives, think of it as like you know after you read this chapter or after today's session you will be able to, and then that's what the bullets are is filling in that sentence. Um, it works out to really very roughly one per section of the book, but again, it depends. Some sections will be overloaded and some will be underloaded. Um, and like I said, the ones that exist probably could use some refinement. So if you're reading through and, um, for example, I don't know if the past groups have updated everything to the second edition. So they might have learning objectives in there that aren't actually covered in the book anymore, or they might be missing things that are covered. So that's something to watch out for as you're, um, you know, as you're prepping the notes. And again, we're going to get into chapter one in a minute here, and it'll make more sense. All right. Oh, and that's right. I did write some learning objectives for this little section. So uh, after today's session, you will be able to explain how our weekly meetings work, uh, sign up to lead a dis discussion, edit the notes on GitHub, and then there will be some more learning objectives, uh, assuming we make it to chapter one. All right. Um, all right, continuing. So um, <laughs> GitHub. People are afraid of GitHub. Uh, I know that a lot of you are probably, um, you know, if you're reading this book, there's a good chance you're kind of new to the data science world and you might have never seen GitHub, might be uh, intimidated by GitHub. Um, my way of looking at it is even tech bros can figure it out. So you'll be fine because you're not someone who's just full of themselves and unwilling to learn. Um, so it's, you'll be fine. Uh, the readme of this has uh, setup instructions um, on GitHub. Gonna zoom in to see. This is the GitHub logo. Uh, it's called the OctoCat. It is a cat octopus thing. Um, so if you see that logo, that opens up GitHub. Um, and this is the repository on GitHub for this book. And so there's the meeting schedule and videos and all this stuff. And then there's this how to present section. And so that has detailed instructions on how to deal with this. Um, and then the really nice thing is the previous cohort, uh, Lydia, their first session, she like walked through editing the notes. I'm not gonna do that fully, um, partly because that already exists there and partly because something I realized is now that the notes basically fully exist, um, you can also just go in here and let's say you find a typo or something, there's just an edit button and you can just edit. You can just do it right on the browser. You don't have to do the full setup. So if you are, you know, brand new to GitHub, start there and then just do that. Uh, once you edit it, you'll you'll say commit changes, and then it'll tell you that you have to create. Um, it, it'll just say yes, basically. Um, I have admin rights, and so I can't show you what it would be like for you. Um, but it'll uh, it'll make you create what's called a pull request, which is basically asking me to pull your change into the main branch. Uh, once you do that, it'll rebuild the notes. Um, and so actually, let me go to, uh, this is, we are in the index, uh, da, 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 index. And I can show you if we go to um, this GitHub, I'm going to italicize tech bros. And like I said, mine, it will tell me I can go, actually, okay, I can create a branch. So it'll say, create a new branch. Ideally, you should say, you know, what you did. And um, you can give more details if you want, and you'll uh, create a pull request. Go ahead and do that. And so, okay, this is creating a, um, a, a pull request, and it's being weird. Um, I think it's being weird because I'm an admin because that did not. Okay, there we go. It, I was like, it should be giving me this green button that says compare and pull request. And I say that and um, that's basically it. You hit create pull request and it will notify me um, or depending how things go in some things we're uh, trying to work out, it might notify other people because I'm trying to off offload some of this work. Um, and then 
it will try to build the book. So it's going to rebuild the notes. If it, if something breaks, it'll tell me and you, and we can work out how to fix whatever broke and you can just continue to edit. Um, a lot of times people will kind of freak out, oh, it broke and they'll like delete the pull request and start over. And that's more of a pain for the most of the time. Like you can do that, but if we've already gone through some reviews, just make the edits. It's okay. You don't, you, you can keep changing because you're over on your own copy. Um, and so it'll, it'll make that change. Uh, I'm going to short circuit because again, I'm an admin and I can do these things and I'm just going to put that change in there. And so what we can do is we'll see over in the actions, since I merged that in, I'm going to cancel this one, but it is running this thing that, uh, important is just deploy book down. So that's deploy the notes and assuming this should be pretty quick. We'll come back here in a second. And um, when I reload this page after that turns green, uh, this will be italicized. So we'll come back and take that. a look at that in a minute. All right. I know I went through that like super fast. Um, like when it's your week, if you have anything, if you run into any issues, you know, we have the whole Slack. That's what we're here for is to help you. So um, let me know if you have problems. This video, like I said, she does, she walks through the entire process. Um, it's harder for me to do because I can override everything and some things automatically do override. So I can't show you as easily what happens. The video is there to see. Um, and like it, it, it should, so I, I don't want to say like, it should be straightforward, but also if it's not straightforward, don't worry, it's not you. It's uh, We can sort it out. All right. So before I go on to the actual content, anyone have any questions? Um, anything they want to say? All right. I am going to pause before I go into chapter one, um, partly because it's okay if we don't make it through chapter one. Um, and I think everyone is probably here now. So... Um, I would like to go around and everyone introduce yourselves. Um, if you, uh, you know, don't want to, um, then we will uh, just like continue on. But I will uh, put a ordered list in the chat in a second here. But I will. Um, Floris is at my top left, so Floris, you're up first. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I am from Belgium and I work uh, on environmental science and ecology. Um, and uh, I mostly work uh, using R. Um, and I did use uh, several chapters of the first edition of this book uh, as well. So I, I have some experience uh, with this, but I'm also very interested to uh, learn more. So that's, uh, I look forward to this booklet. Thanks. Excellent. All right, Paul, you're up next. I'm a retired, disabled veteran, college professor, uh, combat photographer, uh, television producer. Uh, I haven't decided what I want to do when I grow up yet. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I have been working with R just about ever since it came out, but I am by no means any kind of an expert. And uh, I love academia, even though I'm no longer in it. So uh, next. All right, uh, Anne, you are up next. Hi, I'm Anne. Um, I'm working in uh, neuroscience research, and I'm basically the only uh, computational biologist in our lab. So I'm doing all the computational work, and um, there I'm mostly or mainly working with R um, now already since a couple of years. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's me. Okay. Uh, next up is Erin. Hi, everyone. I'm Erin. I'm a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon, and I study human decision making. Um, I previously studied statistics in my undergraduate, and that's when I first 
learned R and got really excited about it and now use it in my research. And I recently attended my first POSIT comp um, where I met some of the R for data science folks and also got the signed copy of this book. So I'm really excited to, <laughs> and to meet you all and also to get involved with this community. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, glad to have you here. All right, Gabby, you are up. Hi, everyone. I'm Gabby. I'm a postdoc at the University of Maryland. Um, I'm an ecologist, carnivore ecologist. Technically, I work with carnivores. I hope your my connection is really bad here in the lab. So I hope I hope everyone can hear me well. I've been using R for the past. 10 or so years, but um, my goal is to read all of this, our essential books, if you will, so that I can actually say I read them, I went through all of them, and yeah. So that's, that's why I'm here, I suppose, to learn from John and from all of you. <laughs> Excellent. Um, all right, Lily, you are up next. Hi, everyone, I'm Lily. And I'm a PhD student in West Virginia University. My research is about the full world impressions analysis. So I've been using R to analyze the data from the super images and also use R to model um, the image features from super images with human positions. And now I'm going to graduate soon. So hopefully after I graduate, I can transit from academy to industry. Awesome. All right, Alexis. Hey everyone, I'm Alexis. I'm a consumer insight analyst in Chicago. Um, I've dabbled a little bit in R in undergrad um, and like the data camp course, but most of my roles have been very heavy with Tableau, Power BI. So a little bit more of like those self-serve tools trying to get a little bit more refined in some cool graphs I've seen made in R. So excited to be here. Great. Uh, Donald. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Donald Slozik. I'm a biostatistician. I work mainly in uh, clinical trials and uh, machine learning validation. And um, I have been with, like Gabby, I've been using R for about 10 years, but I've never really gone through the essential books. So I'm kind of doing the exact same thing, which is awesome that there's another person here to do that. So uh, I'm excited to be here. Okay, uh, and Luke. Hey y'all, I'm Luke. I am a data analyst at a hospital here in Southern California. Um, actually, it's my last day on this job and in a couple of <laughs> weeks I'm going to a different hospital. But yeah, I've known R since grad school in 2018, but I'm another one of those just trying to putting my money where my mouth is and learning the book. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. We've got um, is it Agalic? Yes. Hi. Um, so thanks for uh, um, introducing everyone. Uh, it's really interesting to see all the profiles. I am um, a physician by training, and then I did my PhD. I just completed my PhD in uh, molecular neuroscience uh, this summer. Uh, I'm from France. And I am uh, trying to go against the prejudice that biologists are bad at statistics. And I am uh, so trying to um, teach myself a lot of uh, a lot of that in the to to improve my analysis. Uh, I did use R for my um, for my PhD, but uh, kind of uh, learning on the job. And I was really um, excited to be able to join this cohort and formalize my learning and do it the proper way. Excellent. Um, I don't know, you know, how formal this is per se, but you're reading the book at least. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, next up, we have Shia. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm a research analyst at Ohio University's Institutional Research Office. Like uh, I use R to build student success model, like lots of people here. I use R, but I haven't read this book thoroughly. So I appreciate this chance to, 
allow me to read this book chapter by chapter and understand more and communicate with all of you here. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, next up, we have NM. Uh, hi, my name is Nelson, Nelson Mambre. I'm an electronic engineer. Uh, I studied and lived in uh, Venezuela, but now I'm back on my island that's in Curacao in the Caribbean. Um, I've worked mostly with uh, industrial automation and now focusing on uh, AOT, IoT, um, Internet of Things, more uh, geared toward industrial Internet of Things. And uh, my issue has been I've always programmed the devices where I generate the data, but I have never analyzed it. So now I think, okay, if I'm generating the data from sensors and devices and all of that, um, I should be able to 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 analyze it. So that that's my interest uh, for R. Excellent. Uh, we have Jill next. Hi, um, my name is Jill, and I am an analytics manager in St. Louis. And it sounds like like a lot of people here. I've been using R for a few years now, but never it was very much like on the job learning. So I'm excited to have like a more structured approach because I'm sure I have lots of gaps in my R knowledge. So that's what was exciting to me about this book club. Excellent. And uh, looks like Esperance joined uh, after we made the list. So if you are there, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Hello, everybody. Good evening or good day. Uh, my name is um, Esperance Kujia. I'm a national of the Republic. I'm currently serving as a consultant uh, in ITA uh, Ibada. Um, also, I just got to know about this Slack channel today. I joined, I hope uh, I'll have a great time, learn a lot, a lot about R because uh, R is very, very um, uh, indispensable in our field, in our career, because I, I got to know that without R, I can do research work, I can do postdoc, I can excel in uh, <laughs> any field, I can progress without R, R about the uh, genomic selection, GWAS, marker assisted selection. We use a lot R in genomic uh, background and plant breeding. And I'm here to learn more about it and progress in my career. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Excellent. Well, we're happy to have you here. And I guess I uh, realized I forgot to actually introduce myself other than my name. Um, I am uh, John. I run the R4DS online learning community. Um, right now, that and some open source programming that I'm doing on a grant are my full-time thing. Um, I'm trying to make that a full-time paid thing um, because for the most part, it's not right now. Um, but we just, a few weeks ago, R4DS became part of the Open Collective Foundation, which means that we can accept donations uh, or um, tax-free in the US. So uh, that has been very exciting. And we, like I've applied for another grant and I'm about to apply for another grant uh, to try to make that be kind of the full-time thing and basically to try to expand everything we do. Um, and now I will go back to I was sharing. Oh, and I guess um, I I have been working in R uh, for probably about six years now. Um, I actually, I read the first edition of this book, but I haven't read the second edition. And there's always things to learn. And so I love, um, I, I feel like our group has pretty much every level of um, R ability slash like length of time that you've worked in R from very, very short times to you know, pretty much the whole time R has existed. And I think that's going to be great because um, like those of us who have worked in R longer, we will learn more by having people who, um, you know, haven't. <laughs> and then uh, those of you who haven't will be able to ask us, those of us who have, you know, about some of the things that you're not sure about. So um, it'll be very good. All right. 
Uh, so I, I owe you the, uh, if I refresh, see, we can see Tech Bros is italicized. So that finished. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I had a very intense um, learning experience in R, very, very deep. And so, yes, people think that I uh, have been using it longer. Um, I had the fortune of some very good teachers. So, all right. So with that, we're going to try to get through chapter one. It's kind of a what you what's coming up chapter. If we don't make it through, we don't make it through. It's no big deal, but we'll see what we do. All right. So today um, I'm hoping that we or all of us will be able to describe a typical data science project um, that will be able to explain the reasoning behind the order of content in the book. Uh, at least to some degree, that will recognize the topics that are not covered in the book um, to kind of set our expectations. Um, we will at least um, know how to set up an environment in which you can learn the topics in the book. And um, then the last thing is just to be able to describe how code in the book will look different from code that you're working on in your console. Um, all right. and. Uh, it's great to see you, Erin. I think, yeah, she already left, but um, all right. <laughs> I will try to keep up with the chat. Uh, as you can see, I won't always necessarily. So if you have a question, um, ideally just unmute yourself and ask. We are a discussion group. We're a little large right now um, from experience, probably by the end of the book, we'll be a perfectly sized book club um, where it's comfortable to just have a few of us chatting. If we stay this large, that's great. Just, um, I know it's hard sometimes for people to speak up with this many people in the room, um, but everyone here is friendly or they better be. Um, and so feel free to, to chime in if you have any questions. Um, yes, we will be perfect at any size. And yeah, I don't mean to try to discourage people from showing up, please stay with us. Um, but just by experience, it's a longish book and so, uh, we might not all make it to the end of the book. All right. Uh, so they um, this this graphic is like uh, kind of synonymous with this book. People reuse this graphic in a lot of things, and they'll say, "Oh, you know, the R4DS graphic." Um, this is a typical data science project. Um, you start with importing and tidying. Um, the, those together are sometimes called wrangling data. I have a slide for each of these, so we'll go into more details about that in a second. Um, you have this cycle of understanding where you're transforming the data, visualizing and modeling. Um, and then at the end, communicate to other humans, because if you don't actually tell anyone about it and you, know, you don't explain it to them, then uh, you haven't really done anything in most cases. And then they uh, have the box around everything with program, because programming aids the entire process. You can automate some common tasks and you can uh, solve new pro new problems with greater ease because the uh, baseline stuff you can have all programmed and ready to go. All right, so let's dive into those a little more. <clears throat> uh, we'll start with wrangling. So wrangling is importing plus tidying uh, plus some transforming, which gets into the next cycle. Um, that's wrangling. And the idea is that you're making data usable um, but that often feels like a fight. So they say that's why it's called wrangling, that you're like fighting against the data sometimes. Um, so those those pieces you uh, import from you know, a file on your computer or a database or a web app, um, anything like that in and then into R. Uh, and you know, because you can't do anything until it's in R. You can't do your data science until you have that data. Uh, to work with. Uh, tidying, um, this is actually kind of the whole, like the whole system, Hadley Wickham is kind of famous for tidy data. And all it is, is that the columns in your data should be individual variables and the rows should be individual observations. Now, what that means depends on your data and kind of what you're doing with your data, um, whether like is a row a, a uh, person or is a row a person's visit to a doctor's office? That might be a row. Um, and okay. Yeah, so it says tidying and 
uh, transforming our Wranglate. So I guess uh, that's uh, probably an old leftover note that I didn't clean up. Um, so anyway, so that's that's tidying is making this consistent structure. Columns are variables, rows are observations. Um, and then transform, that's where you like further refine it. Um, you might filter the data uh, to just get rid of columns or get rid of rows that aren't important to you. Maybe you only care, care about a certain time frame or you know some certain factor has to be true, that kind of thing. Um, there is mutating, and I'm using the words that we will see a lot more in this book, but mutating is when you create new variables out of existing variables. And then summarizing, uh, calculate things either for the overall data set or for groups within the data set. Um, <laughs> all right. And then, so the next phase is uh, understanding and communicating. And I just used the uh, kind of breakdown that previous groups had done. It might've been better to break, understand and communicate apart, but whatever. So, all right, understanding, that's visualizing. Um, it Sometimes you might want to skip. You're like, oh no, I, okay, I know my data and now I'm gonna start modeling my data because that's the cool thing that I've been reading about is modeling. Um, but almost always, uh, you. Like that, the first data viz, data viz you make, you'll go, oh, oh, okay. I, I thought that I was, you know, I thought everything was gonna be higher than that. Or I thought I was gonna have much more of a wide distribution. Turns out I do the data viz and everything has one value in this one column that I thought was gonna be all over the place. And so my model's easy, it's always that. Um, there is a separate book, ggplot2, that has more in-depth details about uh, making really fancy data vizs. Um, you can also follow the um, Tidy Tuesday hashtag if you can find a social media platform that is stable for you to follow it on. Uh, Mastodon seems to be winning right now for where we're doing most of Tidy Tuesday. Uh, just to for the quick aside, Tidy Tuesday is a project that we do at the R, at R4DS where we each week we release a data set uh, about something. It's random, all kinds of random things. Uh, this week it was US government grants and last week it was F-bombs on uh, Ted Lasso. So very wide range of things. Um, and then people make visualizations, some people make models, some people, um, I don't know, do all kinds of different things with it. And so uh, that can be a nice way to, to learn is see, you know, like follow some of the people who do kind of cool visualizations and try to reproduce what they did or just try to you know make a baseline uh, re, uh, visualization, or try to just do anything. Try to try to uh, load the data, use a new package, whatever. And so as we go through, I think chances are pretty good that we will use some Tidy Tuesday data sets in some examples. So we'll see that as we go. Uh, so the next piece in that you know in the the graphic is model, and as we'll discuss. Um, this second edition of the book barely touches on modeling because there's a whole separate group of packages uh, that really cover and, and like take care of modeling cleanly, uh, which is tidy models. And so there's uh, tmwr.org is the, the book on tidy modeling. We do have book clubs for that as well. Um, you know, I wouldn't jump there yet. <laughs> I would go through uh, R4DS and that, this book will get you ready to uh, do that book if that's what you decide you want to do next. Um, and then, uh, like I mentioned, the next th or that final step, at least in the uh, the graphic, is communicate. So it's a critical part of data science. Um, doesn't matter matter how good your models are if nobody knows about them. Um, and just the uh, note that um, the first edition focused on our markdown. Uh, a system that's like a system of creating reports. Um, second edition focuses on Quarto for the most part, like at, at their base basic level, they are the same thing. Like Quarto is a, a newer version of the same idea. Um, our book club notes are in our markdown there. And these are like, um, <laughs> that's actually pointing to Quarto. Uh, both of them are, so I need to fix that. But um, the uh, these will have links to this two separate systems to kind of see what their differences are. Um, 
for what we're doing, you really don't have to worry about the difference. And, and you know, if you're just trying to edit the slides, like I said, start with just editing in the browser and until you're familiar with the system and then we can go from there. All right. So the order of content in this book, I, I actually, I think part of why this book is so famous and popular is because of this order that um, importing and tidying are boring. And so because of that, they jump into visualization and transformation. They um, do cool things right away, starting in chapter two. And then they come back and do more of the wrangling once you can kind of see what you're able to do once it's wrangled. So we're going to start with some data that they include in the packages that they, uh, in the tidyverse, um, that's already ready to go. And we can just use it to do some visualization and transformation. Um, someone it, like if you're experienced in any other programming, um, the kind of the standard first program in a lot of programming languages is called hello world. And it's like, go through and print hello world to the screen. And um, someone, I think it was David Robinson, who's like, a, he taught some courses in uh, R and any different things. Um, he said that the reason that people really like R is the hello world of R is a data visualization. Like you actually have a thing that you can use. That's one of the first things you learn how to do. So um, here, that's exactly what we're gonna do. Uh, then, at, so after data viz, transformation and wrangling, uh, we're gonna go into programming. Um, that helps us simplify some steps. I am a, a big fan of programming in R. Um, don't let anyone like look down at R. R actually is like functional programming, which is a very uh, like high level programming concept and but they make it easy. And so people think because it's easy, it must be bad. It's really good programming. So I'm a big fan of R. Um, then uh, within that, so within all of that, they start each chapter with like a motiv motivating example, a bigger picture of why do you care? Why do you want to do this? Um, and then there are exercises woven in uh, throughout the chapters. Um, and something I wanted to discuss, and I don't know what's already in the notes. Um, and it's not really necessarily a discussion yet, because we'll have to kind of decide as we see it. But um, we'll have to sort out, do we want to walk through the exercises like step by step together? Or do we want to like plan to raise them if they're you know, confusing or what? Um, I put this in as a discussion topic, but now that I think about it, I don't know if it will, will make sense until you've seen them, unless you've already looked ahead and seen them. Um, but I I would say, you know, base, I'll shut up for a second. Does anyone have any thoughts on whether we should like walk through the exercises? Well, I will say when you have your chapter, um, you know, that you're leading the discussion on, I recommend at least trying the exercises and I would call out any out if you find them confusing. Yeah, I think it should, like Paul says, it probably def depends on the exercise. And I think that's exactly right. Um, I think we should aim to, to discuss any, like come to the meeting with any that you found confusing or that, um, I don't know, that you thought uh, there might be like, you figured it out, but you think there must be an easier way or things like that. Um, and so, okay. So yes, we, we should do our homework, I think is what it comes down to. Um, and we'll see how they look. I don't know what they're like in here. I haven't, there, there were exercises, but I think they've changed quite a bit in the second edition. So we'll see. Um, all right. So not covered by this book, uh, modeling. Modeling is super important for data science, um, but it's too big of a topic for this book. It was in the first edition um, at a level that I actually found really interesting. And I'm, I'm intrigued to see what I think about it being gone now. Um, we'll see what they go into, um, but they do point you to Tidy Modeling with R by Max Kuhn and Julia Silgi. Uh, we do have book clubs for that. We have one running right now, and I'll probably run another one um, before too terribly long. So uh, yeah, there's that. 
we're not going to go into big data, uh, quote, you know, so-called big data. Um, it's problem specific. If you work with big data, you'll want to learn some other tools. They talk a little bit about data table. Um, there's also a package Sparkly R, which has its own book as well, which is using Spark for uh, big data, but it's called Sparkly R because dplyr is the um, like the, the core tidyverse package and Sparkly R is built to feel like dplyr basically. Um, the book's not gonna cover other programming languages like Python or Julia um, because you should like focus on one tool at a time and then maybe go on to other tools later. I program pretty much exclusively in R personally. Um, I'm a big fan of just going really deep into it, but other, you know, there are a lot of Python jobs out there. And so it might be something that uh, matters for what you wanna do. Um, and so, uh, but the idea is learn the, the basics through uh, R4DS and then, um, you know, go on to Python or Julia or anything else. Rust is a popular one right now, um, but start with R. All right. Uh, they talk a little bit about some prerequisites. They, they mentioned numeric literacy. You have to know like, um, you know, basics of how numbers work or a lot of things probably won't make sense here. They say that you should have basic programming skills. Um, they do go into some, you know, the basics. And, but they point out that there's this book, Hands-On Programming with R by Garrett Rollmond. If you have never done any programming and you're finding the concepts of programming in here really challenging. Um, surprisingly, we've never had a book club for that book. And um, I don't know, I've never read that one. We might have to do that. So if, you know, if we get to the programming section and you're completely lost, um, we might split off and do that book <laughs> at the same time. Uh, We'll see how that goes. Uh, I think like he introduces or they introduce all the programming concepts. I, I don't think they expect you to know anything. So I was kind of actually surprised that they said that that was a prereq prerequisite. Um, you'll need to have R installed. You can download that from CRAN, um, the comprehensive R archive network. Um, and okay, Paul is uh, going through hands-on programming with R and says says they think it thinks it helps. Um, absolutely, I I have the privilege that I have been programming in some form since I was a little kid, uh, and so I can't. It's hard for me to remember what is hard in programming. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if like if you're totally lost. Uh, just let us know and hopefully we can get you caught up. Um, so yeah, there's uh, CRAN or I guess technically some people call it CRAN, uh, the Comprehensive R Archive Network, uh, but it's CRAN. Uh, that you can download R there. Uh, there's a link in the notes and hopefully the link actually goes to the right place. Yes. Um, you can also, so a lot of people get confused about R versus R Studio. R Studio is a product made by the company Posit that you use for editing R and for working in R, it's not actually required for R, working with R, but in this book, uh, they will be talking about the, uh, R Studio. All, everyone who wrote the book works for R or works for Posit. Um, I'm a big fan of R Studio. There are some other uh, integrated development environments or IDs that some people use, but R Studio makes it there is aimed at making it as easy as possible to work in R. Uh, so, all right, I think, oh yeah, there's a, so the next set of prerequisites they talk about is packages. So a package is a collection of functions, data, and documentation. Uh, we'll be seeing a lot of packages as we go through. The first package that you'll want to install is called tidyverse. So if you just do this install packages tidyverse, it actually installs these nine packages. And so it will, it brings a whole bunch of other packages along for the ride. And actually uh, I just copy pasted it because there's more McGritter's still in there. And I I think there's some missing, several missing actually that it'll install. But these are uh, the nine core uh, ones. I think these are the ones that get loaded if you library tidyverse. Although again, McGritter's 
Well, McGritter might not get library. It just gets, anyway. So these are the packages. Uh, we will be reading or learning about these packages throughout the book. Um, they're all, uh, whatever, they're, they're things for working with different things in our uh, dplyr is kind of the main one. That's that your data plier is the idea. It's your data um, manipulator. Uh, forecasts is for categorical variables. Uh, ggplot2 is for plotting. Um, yeah, these are the core, what they call the core tidyverse packages. Um, Luberdate just joined the core of tidyverse. It's the um, like date time uh, package, really useful and important. Um, and oh, and R and R Studio install fine on a Chromebook. That's nice. They also have um, the cloud, uh, cloud dot. I'm not sure if it's rstudio.com or posit.co, um, but there's a RStudio cloud where you can use RStudio online. There's some level of free versus paid. I don't use it, so I can't remember where that cutoff is. Um, per is for like programming in R, iterating and things like that. Um, there's read R for reading um, and writing CSVs mostly. Uh, string R for working with um, strings for, for you know, text. Uh, Tibble is for um, just the the table format that they use in the tidyverse, and then tidy R is for a lot of the reshaping of like expanding and combining columns and things like that. And again, we'll be going through pretty actually. I think all of these in uh, in depth throughout the course of the book. And um, there was in the notes there was a a list of other packages to install, but we'll be installing them as we go through. So if you are trying to run some example code from the book and you see like error in library, ggrepel or whatever, there's no package called ggrepel, that just means you need to install it um, most of the time. Every once in a while that could mean that something is broken or whatever, but most likely you can just install it and you'll be happy and go from there. Um, in the book, they do have a list of uh, the packages that they use throughout the book and you could install those right now if you want, but we'll use, install them as we go. You can also actually, we don't have it in here, but if you go through the um, the instructions on how to set up your own computer for editing the notes, there's a step in there that will install everything that is used in the notes onto your machine. And so you just run that one step and it'll install everything. Um, so. If you follow those steps, the, those instructions that are at the beginning of this, uh, that would also handle that. All right, and then I think this is the last thing, last section at least. So the first convention uh, to watch out for is they have this um, like hash greater than. Uh, so if, when you see hash greater than in the book, um, I say it's the, uh, greater than in our studio, but it's actually like the line below greater than, it's the line where your output um, shows up. So if you type one plus two in uh, RStudio or into the R console, you'll just get this part, but they show it with this because that way this this thing, the hash is a comment character. So it means it doesn't execute as code and you can just copy this, paste it into your console and you can run it even though this shouldn't run. This is the output, but they do that so that you can do that. Um, and yeah, all of if you're looking at both our notes and the online version of their book, there will be uh, just a little button to copy any code. Uh, so you can copy it and paste it into your console and work with it that way. All right. And then uh, there are rules for what code looks like. And it is helpful when you're trying to read the code to be able to see these that you'll have um, this, there's a the special font our font's not exactly the same as their font, but there's the special kind of typewriter font for code. And then if there's parentheses, that means it's a function. So sum parentheses means this function called sum, which you use to calculate a sum, or mean parentheses means the function mean. And then if you see it without parentheses, see something without parentheses, that means it's like an object. It's a data or a variable or an argument to a function. So flights or x or um, code or font, evidently, the way I have this written. Um, and then the, the last piece is you will sometimes see this like dplyr colon colon. Um, 
what that means is it's this function filter from the package dplyr. Uh, the colon colon is just telling R what package to look in. You can also, we'll learn about this more later. Um, so uh, I will answer your question in a moment, Gabby, as soon as I, I don't know what you mean, but okay. Um, I think it's really helpful in general to learn how to pronounce your code so that you can read it and like think it in your head as you're reading it without having to stop and you know say dplyr colon colon filter. So just down to this weird smash together string of letters is pronounced dplyr. Just learning that so that you don't have to think dplyr, you can think dplyr. It helps, it, it makes it easier to read your code to yourself. And so as you're reading the code, uh, you don't, get lost in it as fast. If you can think of this as dplyr and uh, also think of the colon colon as just apostrophe s. So dplyr's filter is how you read that. And it lets you just more quickly read through code and be less confused by it. Um, I just, that's my soapbox. I really recommend trying to learn to read your code out loud um, and occasionally even say it out, out loud. So Gabby asked, John, quick question. What do you put in the slash slash, which is, or the tick tick back ticks that make, that's what makes the code font. Um, packages, functions, I've always wondered. So generally anything that is representing code um, when you're making notes like this, you, the tradition is you put it in back ticks. Now, but that does like your question is valid of, so is a package representing code or is it representing like this concept outside of the code? And um, depends. So like you can see right here on the screen, um, I did not, I didn't put any of this in dplyr or in, in backticks. So it's a little fuzzy, um, but for the most part, like usually packages I will put in backticks. Anything that is something you would type into your console, I would put into those backticks. Um, just in general, the backticks are really good to learn um, on almost any system, uh, like Slack, or I think actually even maybe even on Zoom. So let's see if you put something in. Nope, not on Zoom. But if you put things in backticks on a lot of systems, it makes it look different. And so it stands out as code. And then the other one is if you do three backticks, um, uh, sorry like that, um, yes, it definitely works in Slack. And I highly recommend learning to do this in Slack because if you do the three back ticks, it like makes a whole block of code that's easy to copy and paste, it's easy to read. And so if you're asking a question on our Slack, learn to do it inside of three back ticks. And I just gave myself, I realized a, uh, a thing to deal with because in our notes, we put the chat log and we close the chat logs in three back ticks. And so now I'm gonna have to go through and clean that up and make sure it doesn't break, but um, it's fine. I will deal with it. Uh, we've had it before. It's not like, it's not a big deal. Um, but yeah, so so generally back ticks mean code uh, both in this book and elsewhere and I think. Oh, oh, that's right. We do have some quick resources. And if you can stay, I will try to uh, finish this up real quick. So uh, some things that aren't in the book, th they talk a little bit in the book, but um, I'll, I go into a little bit more detail. When you are trying to debug, trying to figure out what's going on, um, there's a whole talk that uh, they had at our studio conference uh, a few years ago about error messages that the first thing to do if you're, if you're, if something's not working, is, you know, well, first thing is often just, you know, take a deep breath and then really actually read the error messages. In the tidyverse, um, they have done a lot of work in the last couple of years, especially to make sure that the error messages give you as much information as they can. Often they will tell you, you know, like, hey, did you mean blah, blah, blah? And they'll tell you the code that you should type to fix your issue. So actually read error messages is the first thing. Um, and then if the error message doesn't make any, any sense to you, there's the famous one in R, object of type closure is not subsettable. That doesn't make any sense to most people. Um, but you can copy paste it into Google. And often if you just copy paste the whole error, 
you'll find something telling you how to fix that error. Often that thing you find will be on stackoverflow.com. Uh, just a little caveat that stackoverflow.com is sometimes a toxic place that uh, people will yell at you and be mean. So be ready for that. Uh, but they also often have lots of good answers. So that's good. Uh, probably everyone here knows that our Purdue's online learning community uh, is an alternative that we try to be friendly. Uh, every once in a while, I see people responding a little bit like they're on Stack Overflow, and we try to back them off and tell them, hey, this is a friendly place. Um, and we have volunteers who answer, try to answer every question. Uh, but again, you guys know that because you're here. All right. And then another bonus, just there's this package called Reprex for reproducible example. Um, I recommend when you're trying to figure out what's going wrong, read the help for how to use this package. Um, it's at reprex.tidyverse.org. Uh, the general idea is you say what packages you use. Um, you provide some subset of your data that you need. That you need. Uh, you can use this function dput to take data and like backform. It'll tell you how to create that data. Um, so that you can like tell someone else the data and then try to make your code easy to read. And so if you go through this whole process of making a reprex, often just in doing it, you'll go, oh, I had a typo or, oh, I forgot to library this package I needed or whatever. So just the process of making the reprex can often be enough to help you solve it. But if it doesn't help you solve it, it lets whoever you're asking the question to run your code and then try to fix it. Um, so. That's an aside. It's there's a link in the notes to this reprex package, and again, we'll talk about it as we go. There, okay, that is it. So that's that's everything. Um, yeah, next week Luke will be presenting the data viz chapter about uh, ggplot two, um, and uh, Gabby has the week after that, um, and then uh, that's it. Uh, but I so. These uh, notes, r4ds.io slash r4ds. And if you go to um, the uh, the GitHub uh, Octocat, there's a link to our spreadsheet. This spreadsheet's also linked in our channel on Slack where you can sign up. Um, and I will point that out. And I, I recommend going, like if you see a chapter, don't choose a chapter that you know, choose a chapter that you don't know. That's the best thing to do because then you have to read it and understand it so you can discuss it with everyone else. So choose a chapter that sounds interesting. And uh, all right. And I will see everyone next week. Stop sharing. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. Have a nice day, everyone.